My name is Dr. Shruti Sharma. As the world grapples with climate change, managing greenhouse gas emissions has become a critical global priority. The GHG Protocol, developed by the World Resources Institute (WRI) and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, which is WBCSD, is the gold standard for measuring and managing corporate emissions. As mentioned in my previous video, the GHG protocol divides emissions into three categories. The scope one, which covers direct emissions from owned or controlled sources. The scope two, which we will be discussing today, are the emissions from indirect, stemming from the purchase of electricity, steam, heat or cooling. And scope three, which includes all other indirect emissions across the value chain. According to the Carbon Disclosure Project CDP, scope 2 emissions account for around 40 to 50 percent of a company's total emissions in India, especially in energy intensive sectors like IT and manufacturing. In India, scope 2 emissions are particularly significant due to the country's heavy reliance on coal for electricity. As of 2023, Nearly 50% of India's electricity comes from coal, making it one of the largest sources of GHG emissions. However, India is also a leader in renewable energy growth, aiming to achieve 500 gigawatt of renewable capacity by 2030. According to the data, coal contributes to 72% of total electricity generation in India, making it a primary source of scope to emissions for industries heavily reliant on grid electricity. In India's energy mix, uh, which is renewables, now account for 40% of installed capacity. But actual generation still tilts heavily towards fossil fuels. Companies like Tata Steel and Emphasis are increasingly investing in an on-site solar or power purchase agreements to reduce their scope to emissions. For Indian companies, reporting scope to emissions is not just a regulatory requirement, but a pathway to better sustainability rankings and investor confidence. In fact, ESG ratings, which influence investor decisions, heavily weigh scope to emissions as they directly reflect the company's energy efficiency and renewable energy strategy. CDP India reports that 76% of large companies now disclose their scope to emissions. India's Perform, Achieve and Trade, which is the PAT scheme, encourages energy efficiency improvements in industries like cement, steel and textile, directly impacting their scope to emissions. For example, if we take a case study of emphasis, which became carbon neutral in 2020 by adopting energy efficiency measures and purchasing renewable energy certificates, which is RECs, the scope to emissions dropped by 55% in five years. Isn't it great? Now, the GHG protocol recommends using two methods to calculate scope to emissions. The first one is location-based method. Now, this approach calculates emissions using the average emissions intensity of the electricity grid in your geographic area. It reflects the energy mix, which can be coal, natural gas, nuclear, renewables, used to supply your local grid. The second method is market-based method. Now, this method uses the specific emission factors associated with the energy you have contracted or purchased. Now, for instance, if you purchase renewable energy through a PPA, which is a power purchase agreement or green energy certificates, your scope to emissions will be lower than using electricity from a coal fired power plant. Here's a step by step guide to calculating your scope to emissions. The first is to gather your energy consumption data. Now, the step is to determine how much electricity, steam, heat or cooling your organization consumes over a given period, which is usually one year. Now, this information can be found in utility bills or obtained from energy meters installed at your facilities. 
Now, second is electricity, which is measured in kilowatt hours. Steam, heating or cooling, which is measured in megajoules or other relevant units. The second step is to select the calculation method, which is to decide whether you use the location-based or market-based approach, as I mentioned earlier, depending on the data available and your reporting needs. Companies often report both methods to ensure transparency and alignment with stakeholder expectations. The third step, which is very important, is to determine the emission factors. For the location-based method, find the appropriate grid emission factors. Now, this can often be obtained from government agencies or grid operators. For example, the US EPA publishes emission factors for different regions of the US and the IEA provides global data. For the market-based method, gather specific emission factors from energy contracts or renewable energy certificates, which is RECs. Now, some suppliers provide emission factors in the documentation of your energy purchase agreement, so it becomes easy. Now, the fourth step is to perform the calculation. Now, here's the formula to calculate emission, which is very simple. Now, emission, which is nothing but which is calculated in metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent is equal to energy consumption, which is calculated in kilowatt hour or megajoules multiplied by emission factors, which is carbon dioxide equivalent. Now, this equals to your energy consumption. Now, for electricity consumption, use kilowatt hours as the unit of measurement. The emission factor, which is carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour will depend on the source of electricity in your region or specific to your energy provider. Now, for example, if your organization consumed 1 lakh kilowatt hour of electricity in a year and the average grid emission factor is 0 0.5 kilogram of carbon dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour using the location-based approach, your scope to emissions will be equal to 1 lakh into 0 0.5, which is the emission factors, which is equal to 5 lakh kilograms of carbon dioxide equivalent or 500 metric tons of your scope to emissions. Now, the last step is to verify and report. After calculating your scope to emissions, it is crucial to verify your data for accuracy. Now, this can be done internally or through third party auditors. Reporting scope to emissions is often a requirement for sustainability frameworks such as the Carbon Disclosure Project and the compliance with ESG, which is Environmental, Social and Governance Standard. Now, how do we reduce the scope to emissions? Now, we can use various methods to reduce our scope to emissions such as optimize energy use through technology upgrades by improving your insulation or more efficient lighting and heating system. You can even transition to renewable energy sources such as solar, wind or hydropower. Purchasing renewable energy certificates which is RECs can also help lower your market-based scope to emissions. Now, enter into agreements with energy providers to secure renewable energy for a long-term period reducing emissions and ensuring energy cost stability by purchasing PPAs, which is power purchase increments. You can even look for an on-site renewable energy generation. Install solar panels or other renewable energy systems to generate your own power and reduce reliance on carbon intensive grids. One major development that has helped companies globally is the scope to guidance provided by the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Now, this guidance ensures that no matter where a company is located, they can use consistent methods to calculate and report the scope to emissions. Accurate reporting and reduction of scope to emissions are critical to achieving sustainability goals. As investors, customers and regulators, put more pressure on businesses to prove their climate commitments, managing scope to emissions becomes an essential part of corporate responsibility. Scope to emissions might seem like a piece of large puzzle, but they represent a big opportunity for businesses 
to take meaningful climate action. Whether you're a small company or a global brand, reducing these emissions is your win for both your bottom line and the planet. You want to learn more about how your company can tackle scope to emissions? Hit that subscribe button and stay tuned for more insights on corporate sustainability. Till then, thank you.